The Sean Day Phoenix Arm Brister is a New York City based pole instructor and HIV AIDS activist. On this episode, he explains why pole can be an uplifting and affirming experience for all. Pole dancing is one of the oldest forms of American entertainment. With speculated origins stemming from the Great Depression, pole dancing has evolved to become an empowering form of self-expression extending across cultures and genders. My next guest, Deshaun Day Phoenix Armbrister, is a New York City-based pole dance instructor, pole dancer, and HIV AIDS activist. On this episode of The Chris David Show, he'll explain why pole dancing is so much more than meets the thigh. I mean... I. <laughs> Welcome, Deshaun. Where you at, Deshaun? Are you there? Here I'm he is. Here. I'm here. He, hey. yes. yes, we're doing this. So first off, um, I just want to say happy belated to you. You know, mm-hmm. you had a birthday and everything. Yeah, um, thank you. And and I I tend to for some reason lately I've been having a lot of Aquariuses or Aquarii. I don't know what is the plural. Oh, Aquarians, yeah. Aquarians, thank Mm -hmm. you. Aquarians, all right, cool. So I tend to have a lot of them on the show, and I don't know what that is. So wait, is it? Did did I say it right? Is it Deshaun? Is it Deshaun or Deshaun? Oh, it's Deshaun. Deshaun, I'm so sorry. Well, I said it right, didn't I? Yeah, you did. Yeah, okay, okay, good. Yeah, so Deshaun. That's where. Um, so there's actually a funny story where I got my nickname Day from. Okay. Long story short, very, very short, in the days of the AOL Instant Messenger um, era, my AOL friend... AOL Instant Messenger. Yeah, my friend Daryl, that, I'm aging myself, clearly. Uh, my friend Daryl, he no, you, spelled my right. nickname Day, D-E-Y. Okay. Um, but that's not how you spell my full name. It's just D-E-S-H-A-U-N. Um, okay. But yeah, I just like the way that he spelt it. So, and because there's so many people named Deshaun, that was like, oh, let me just use Day as like my nickname, and it's always stuck yeah. in sense. Yeah, I actually like that spelling though. That's a really, that's a really different spelling of it. Like, yeah. I have a unique spelling of my name because right. people are so quick; they want to spell it with a, with a ch. There's no h, or they want to spell it with a k. There's no k. Right. And like I <laughs> always like I say on this show, if you go to the Chris David show and. It's somebody with an H in their name. That ain't me. So exactly. I feel sorry for you because <laughs> I feel sorry for you because you know I don't know who show you're going to. But anyway, yeah. I want to. I want to. I want my audience. I want everybody to know a little bit more about you. So, where'd you grow up? So I was born and raised in New York City. Um, originally from Brooklyn. That's All right, Brooklyn stand up. Brooklyn, Brooklyn stand, stand up. up. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I lived all over Brooklyn, Bed-Stuy, Flatbush, Crown Heights, um, of the like. I've also, I'm literally New York. Like, I've lived in every borough except for probably the Bronx and Staten Island. Those are the I'm surprised because we've all ventured into the Bronx at some time or another. Oh, yeah. I ventured into the Bronx. <laughs> I ended up living in the Bronx. Okay. It's yeah, we... It's a totally different thing. Yeah. But no, um, okay. but yeah, but at the moment, I do live in Midtown Manhattan. Um, I've literally born and raised in New York and lived in New York. So I haven't right. lived anywhere else, um, to be honest with you. You're um, such a unicorn because yeah. people like you are so rare. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It, yeah. it, it, it's so rare to find someone nowadays, like 10, 15 years ago, you still could. But today to find someone who's still a New York City all the way, and you're from Brooklyn. Once again, Brooklyn stand up. And I'm, I keep having these Brooklyn Aquarians on my show. So, because we the best, you know, we just yeah, the best, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. And then, and I think I told you this before. I'm an Aquarius rising. So, yeah, yeah exactly. Do, play play the, the yeah, play the, the trouble sound effect for that. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yes. Yeah, so, and, and, and the thing about you guys is, you just have this way of being just. You're you're able to just be alone. 
yeah. but like long periods of time, like you really don't need to be engaged and bothered with a lot of people. Right. A lot of the time it's just that, um, funny enough, when folks call Aquarius detached, it's not necessarily that we are emotionally detached, but sometimes we, like you said, we have to step away from the world to really reflect on the state of the world. Most times within ourselves, we're all, I know I can only speak for my, myself truly as well too. Right. I do a lot of self introspection, a lot of self reflection, um, as best as possible, try to dig deep into my shadow selves and things of that nature. So sometimes when I am kind of away from society in a sense, or I'm kind of paused, where it's always like, whoa, the day okay? Like, I'm okay. I'm doing all right. It's just that I'm probably at a moment where I am at a, maybe a bit of a low, but I got to get it back in order to get to that high. I understand. Or completely. also to think how the world is going in that sense. So, like, yeah. Right, right. And, and you mentioned something that I wasn't even going to touch on today, but I'm probably going to have you on again just to let you yeah. know. But and we can get into that another time. But today I want to talk about pool. But I'll go into what you just mentioned, how important shadow work is and how important it is to go inside of your shadow self and, and really go back to the person that you were. I'll say when you were eight years old, right. because when you were eight years old, you knew who you were. You knew what you wanted to be. I mean, you really didn't know who you were in, in the sense of like who, who we are as adults. But I always make this joke because I, you know, I've worked with kids and I say, you know, kids fly and they, they have superpowers before they hit a certain age. Right, exactly. Because when they hit a certain age, that's when the teachers are telling them, no, 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 you can't do that. Or their parents are saying, no, 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 you can't do this. And, you know, I say it's important for us to go back to that time because that's when we are our true authentic selves. And like right. for me, just, just to throw this in, I knew when I was that age that I wanted to have a talk show. Because if you right. think back to that era, that was all the talk shows were on TV. Martel, Geraldo, uh, Jenny Jones, Ricky Lake. Uh, uh, Literally, I could yeah. go on all day, all day. And I knew that that's what I wanted to do. But I let society and my parents and my family and my friends convince me, no, you should maybe go be a teacher. Or maybe you should go be a doctor. Right. Or maybe you should go do something else. Anyway, right. I wanted to know, though, so how many of you, you know, were there out in Brooklyn, like growing up? So it's me and my, well, it was me and my mom, basically. I'm my only child. Oh, so you're child, an only child. Yeah, only child. Well, clap so it up mom. for the, let's clap it up for the only children. Exactly. Only children. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Um, I, I, well, I was the only that, child in the house, so I, I, I can relate. Yeah, but, so I always say that in terms of being the only child, like, I wouldn't say that I was spoiled per se. I did get what I want, but it was more so in the merit of, well, if I'm doing good in school. Or if I'm like, you know, doing excellent chores and things of that nature. And it wasn't like I had to work hard, hard, so to speak. Right. But my mom did instill that within me. And um, that's, I guess, that's also kind of lent a little bit to my independence. Because I mm -hmm. feel like if I work hard and I do what I need to do, whatever, then I get what I, what I want. Just, I mean, right. I've gotten no's in life, absolutely. But the yeses is because I've worked towards it. And, I'm, yeah, I'm... I'm very, it's hard to say no <laughs> when I really want something um, yeah. to like really happen, so to speak. So, but yeah, but I also did grow up with my grandmother as well as like a couple of other like people in my family, my uncle, my my cousin, who I call my sister, because she grew up in my household and stuff like that as well, too. But it's always been me and my mom. Yeah, yeah. just me and my yeah. mom. Yeah. I'll ask you about your mom a little later and mm -hmm. when I get a little further in. Um, what do you remember though most? about growing up when you were growing up right. out there in Brooklyn? You know, the thing that I always like to say that I remember most growing up in Brooklyn, I was, I will say this, and it's no shade. We In our economy, I would say like we're working class poor family, right? Um, we're black, we was a black family living in Brooklyn, um, not necessarily in luxury. However, I didn't feel that. I felt I had a pretty good, damn good child, childhood, right? My mom, um, she was very, like, I would say just growing up, she was very accepting of me and allowing me to kind of just venture into whatever my interests were. She didn't make me feel limited in in essence. I mean, there were certain things 
probably when I was getting older, because like we just mentioned here, right? Parents want you to be doctors, be social exactly. work, be whatever the case may be. Exactly. Um, so when those conversations came up in the later years, but other than that, like even when I was a kid, she had me in martial arts. Um, I was exposed to dance actually at a very young age in elementary school. First of all, it was West African dance. Um, I even had <laughs> exposure to the ballet. But because of social ignorance, right? Funny enough, it was Ballet of America. And I was a little kid at that time. And the one thing that held me back from exploring ballet, so to speak, was the tights. It was like the little underwear and stuff like that. And all I can say is look at me now. <laughs> yeah, because you're now, right? a little underwear now. So I mean, see, you. I mean, I mean, maybe, maybe. <laughs> Maybe I just needed that when I was older. Who knows? Um, but with that being said, I, I was exposed to a lot. I did a lot of um things in terms of like the arts when it came to school plays. You know, I did like Little Shop of Horrors. I'll never forget in, like the fourth grade. We did Annie in like kindergarten. We did quite a few other like assemblies and stuff like that. I remember in school. Um, now that I think about it, I did a lot of arts up until maybe junior high school. I kind of cooled it down, but that's when I was more into writing. So writing, I've always been like a multifaceted, like just hands on and everything. Um, even at high school, I was voted like most involved. <laughs> Where'd you go to high school? Where'd you go? I went to A. Philip Randolph Campus High School in Harlem. Shout um, and this was like after I had moved out of Brooklyn, so I was like in like Upper West Side, close to Harlem. I know, at this yeah, point. I I know that area. Did you? Um, <laughs> I wasn't even going to ask this. Did you ever encounter Azalea Banks? I know she's from that neighborhood. You know, funny, no, I have not. No, uh -huh. I have not. <laughs> shout out to Upper West Side and shout out to Harlem and shout out to Azalea Banks. Love her. Um, listen yeah. to me, though. I, I, I want to know, though. Now, one, normally when I have people on who are of a queer experience, mm -hmm. I like to ask them when they knew. And I, I know you were mentioning your mother and, you know, her being very accepting of you and just very, you know, um, just very accepting of, of, of her baby, her only baby. Um, right. When did you know? I knew very, very, very young. Um, my first kiss actually was with a boy. <laughs> it was with a boy. I'll just put it this way. It was, I had a babysitter and her son, Jeremy, we were playing like Sleeping Beauty. I was Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> and of course I laid down and closed my eyes. He gave me a kiss or whatever. And that was my first kiss, and I, I liked it, clearly. Um, but <laughs> I always knew that I was different. Of course, I didn't know what gay was, right? Like, right. When, when you're a kid, you're just living life. You're, like, worrying about toys and stuff like that. Like, I, exactly. But in the sense of knowing I was different in terms of other boys, I guess, right? I personally used to always love more of the female characters. Like, Storm was the very first like one for me personally that I thought I was a fictitious character, but that looked like me, that embodied strength. That was a woman. I was like, oh my God, like that's that that's why I love Storm too freaking death. Um, but always used to choose like female characters in video games. My mom, like I said, she used to let me dance to the fucking spice girls. Excuse my French, but she used to let me dance to the spice You're girls good. in the okay, good, yeah, in the backyard. We're like, very laid like, back here. Like I'm I'm informative. I'm yeah. a journalist, but yeah. I curse too. So. Okay, great. Cause I, exactly. I do do I you do you? Um, but no. So like those, those type of things, like I definitely knew. Mm -hmm. Now, when it did come to growing older, was I aware that like people who are queer, who are gay, wasn't necessarily accepted? I started becoming aware of that. Yes, and um, that was even as early as I remember. I used to go to um this church in Brooklyn, Fresh Baptist Church, and I'll never I'll, I'll say it, and I'll never forget how there was a choir director. At this point, I wasn't going to church like that because my mom, she's very spiritual, but she didn't have to be in a building just to praise the Lord, so to speak, right? Um, and especially once like television and TD Jakes came about, that that really settled, and she didn't really have to go, right? Um, but with that being said, I remember there was a a choir director who came in and it was like talks to how they didn't want faggots on the pulpit and i was like oh okay so wow like you know like me not knowing like what gay was but knowing that i was a little bit different that maybe i was a little more feminine blah 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 and then growing up that makes you kind of change your mind like well do i really like girls should i like xyz but i always know i was attracted to men always just knew i always just knew 
I, like there was no hiding it from me other than trying to hide it from society and suppress it to be safe or feel seen or that type. But that didn't last long. I'll put it that way. So, so <laughs> did you do that? Did you have, did you, did you have girlfriends and you know, did you date girls? I did, okay. but I, they were more like sisters. I'll put it that way. Did I kiss? Like, I would, I would and I love them to death. Like, I, all from elementary up until maybe let's say like junior high school, I, I had the same group of friends and the same group of girlfriends, right? But in junior high school, that's when I started dating, I guess, girls or whatever. And ironically enough, even nowadays, they're queer of queer persuasion. Funny enough, like one of my one of my ex girlfriends is about to get married to a wife. <laughs> like you know, funny enough. Um, but yeah, there's all like shout out to, to me. her. Shout yeah, out shout to, her. to her. Yeah, congratulations, yeah. Chanel. Shout congratulations, out Chanel. Chanel. Um, she's really dope. But she really dope. I think she does acting. She's into like theater and stuff. And but she's awesome. But no, I, I had girlfriends, but it was more so of like, okay, these are girls that I kind of vibe with, kind of chill with, and maybe that was right. just it was definitely a massive thing because once I started coming out to people, of course I got hit with the oh, oh we knew we was waiting on you. Who took you to the pier. Do you remember who took you down there to the pier when you were younger? Oh yes. So tell me about I, that. So this is definitely fast forwarding. Um, I'm okay. 16 years old at the point. I'm in high school, of course. I finally came out. Like I finally came out. It, like I said, me trying to suppress it was very short lived. Um, very short lived. Um, so with that being said, it was I had an ex boyfriend. His name was Julio, and I I met him because of course online platform started to grow like Sconex. I'm bringing it back to Sconex. That was like one I've of the, never heard of that. What is so that? So Sconex that was the, the predecessor of Facebook, the predecessor of my like it was like around the MySpace yeah. era, like just like that, right? But it was for high schoolers. It got shut down because unfortunately high schoolers were sharing nudes things that yeah nudes and things that they weren't supposed to oh. of course that's considered like child pornography so they got shut right. down um but with that being said when i was on it there wasn't anything like that going on or whatever, right. right but i met my boy my it sounds like it's kind of like the loop do you remember a chat line yes exactly that's exactly okay. all right yep. okay yeah i okay. do remember the loop yep okay um so yeah so basically that's what we had met we finally met in person he used to go to this um center called the hedrick martin institute which is one of the largest LGB LGBT centers in New York City. They also have since expanded to New Jersey. And, and I was dating him. He took me around. I met some of my best friends ever <laughs> at this mm -hmm. point because he introduced me to Matt and um, Todd or Robin Banks, who's a drag queen. One of my best friends is a drag queen. So shout I met, out to Robin Banks. People. Yeah, yeah, shout out to Robin Banks. Let me shout my yeah. girls out. Um, Robin Banks, so hit up my cash app. I know you got the money. Yeah, 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 it. absolutely. I know you got and it. With that being said, it's like he, him and Matt and them all took me to the pier. That's when I first started getting exposure of our queer community. We used to hang out. We used to like watch the like the Vogers on the pier do the Vogue. And I even we even had like a little Kiki house at one point. Like I was part of the Kiki scene, very short lived kind of sort of. Um, okay. But I like I dipped my toe into it. But then in college, because I had people from New York as well, too, because we all went to SUNY Newports upstate. Um, Shout out to SUNY Newports. Yes, yeah, and shout out to my homegirl Paula. My homegirl Paula went there years yeah, ago. Cool, cool, she cool. still went there, so shout out to her. Did you? Are you? Uh, did you pledge any frat when you were there? At SUNY New no, I had an interest at one point because the thing we was trying to bring like a queer fraternity on there, I like understand. a gay fraternity on there. But um, because the group of folks who were trying to put it together, myself included, was so busy doing other things. Because I was in a dance team up there for all four years. Culture Shock Dance Troupe. Shout out to Culture Shock. I was Shout the vice out president to them. for my Shout life. Shout out to Culture Shock. All right. Period. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I was going to say something else. Shit, I'll just say it anyway. I mean, um, yeah. a, lot, a lot of frats already have, you know, queer activity going on. I mean, oh, I mean absolutely. absolutely. Not that I've I'm seen anything. Say I'm just saying. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to say no more about that. Because nobody going to get mad at me. I mean, it is but, what uh, it is. I mean, you know, it is what it is. But, but speaking of college, yeah. speaking of college, how did, how did you get into pole? Like, were you in college? Was it like one of those drunken mechanical bull things and you got into pole? You or know like, what? How Funny did you enough, get into that? Okay, man? so what always intrigued me was I used to, when I started going to gay clubs like Rush and Splash and things of that nature, whatever, I used to see the Go-Go Boys. And once again, thinking about it, I'm like this nerdy kid who came up pretty 
not exactly sheltered. Like I knew what certain things were, but my mom was very much like, oh, like, you know, make sure you hit the books, make sure you do this, make sure you do that, da, 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 right? Yeah. So I had to explore my own social life, my own way. And I had a good group of friends to do so with. So um, they never got me into any, any type of trouble that we couldn't like that we couldn't handle, so to speak, or whatever. And we've always had a good time, good energy, right? Um, but but yeah, with that being said, I used to see Coco Boy stuff like that. And respectfully, I used to be like, oh, like I would kind of want to do that, but like I would like be dancing, dancing, like because I just love to dance. I always seen life as like a music video. Just as, like, that's the way that I've envisioned life. Cause that's I just did I used to dance everywhere. Dance on fucking trains, dance just everywhere, right? Um it's showtime. So, yeah, very short, almost showtime, kind of sort of, uh, not that level, but I used to like want to dance. Yeah. And then for me, the very first strip club that I ever went to was the Blue Moon in Newport. So it was like this small little, almost like trailer <laughs> um strip club, but it was nice on the inside. I ain't going to lie. Like on the outside, it didn't look like much, but on the inside, like that was my first exposure to actual strippers. And it didn't give like what the movies was given. It was like very much like regular girls. One one shorty I will not forget. It was this white girl, pretty thick, had glasses on. Um, I remember because she was blonde as well too, or whatnot. And it, it intrigued me. I was like, oh, you know, shorty's like doing her thing or whatever. Like, like you know, it was a small set. It wasn't like a huge type club situation. But I liked the fact that it was like this normal quote unquote girl. Mm -hmm. Doing right. this, it wasn't just like some like oh like you know like fancy body woman that was in front of me or whatever, right? So that was where my entry came in. Fast forwarding, much later into life, much more into like my adulthood, let's say, right? When I was in my like late twenties, I get a day job, dance in general for me because um life happens. Um, it wasn't hitting the way I needed to, so I got stuck into the whole finding the day job thing and working nonprofit along the way type thing, right? So I worked for this community organization and they wanted to they wanted to pair up or partner with a pole studio who ironically was ran by a career stripper. Her name is um Mona Marie. Really dope. Shout out to Mona. With, yeah, shout out to Mona. Like she's worked with like Madonna, Missy Elliott, a couple people, as well as worked like as an erotic dancer, right? Um, still do if I'm not mistaken. And she had a studio called Pole Um ooh, Poletic Justice. There we go. Poletic Justice. Yeah. Oh, Clap the pole up, studio like names. That. The pole Those studio names. names. You want to like it? You want to like it? Yeah. Um. So yeah. So that was my first exposure, and I'm thinking like, oh shoot, like I didn't know that studios existed. Number one, so I'm thinking like it was just stripper stuff. But number two, because she was the first person I like came across, I was like, oh, like strippers is just like running this shit. Like they're doing these type of things. They're only the studios. They're making places, right? So then, um. I'm at work at one point, like just looking stuff up and I'm on Facebook, just like doing outreach stuff. And I kid you not, Facebook is the feds because somehow in some fashion, somehow in some fashion, a uh, event called Pole Play, shout out to Pole Play. I love this so much, um, Aerial Edge. They came up and it was an open pole night and it was at House of Yes. And I, I was like, oh, I don't know if I should sign up. And my best friend Robin was working with me at the time. And he was like, oh, like, you should just do it. Like, just email, see what happens or whatever. Like, you just never know. And I emailed respectfully. I was like, hey, I have no idea about pole. I never really stripped or anything, but I would like to try it out. Can I come in? And it was like, yeah, like, we, we don't mind. Like, you know, we're not about the level thing. We just want to give it space. So I went there. Um, I'll never forget the very first song I ever danced to was Drew Barrymore by SZA. <laughs> I had on this little shout like out hat. I, yeah, and I shout out to Drew Barrymore. I love that song. Oh my god, I'm not a singer, but I, you know, I, I just love that. It's, song. it's funny you bring that up because what I find is everybody remembers the first song or, or like the song that was on the first time they did something. Yeah, like you remember that being the first record that was on when you full danced. Like yeah. I remember the first record I ever sung karaoke to. Shout out to my friend Katrina. Um, you better watch my show or else. Right. But um, <laughs> shout out to her because she took me karaoke, uh, took me to karaoke. And and um, my first karaoke song was September by Earth, Wind, and Fire. And I yeah. remember that because yeah. you, know, you just remember those things. Like, I'm sure you remember what song was on, you know, the first time, you know, the first time. So I, I, yeah, yeah anyway. I remember the first time I ever gave a lap dance. I ever danced to um, was Candy Shop by 50 Cent. <laughs> That was one of my boyfriends. Yeah, it, 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 I took him to well, the candy shop. Right, here's the thing. 
because you, your name now you, now your 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 dancing name is is Day Phoenix. Yep. You told me where Day came from. Yeah. Where did Phoenix come from? So the Phoenix. Well, I'm, I'm okay. My mother will probably hear. Well, audio, listen. But, that's yeah. why they need to watch the show on YouTube. Exactly. So if you watch on, nice if you watch the Phoenix. show, you're going to see Deshaun's tattoo is huge. Like it covers up his, his whole right arm. It's your right Have arm, plenty. right? Yeah, but it's my right. It's my right. Right. It covers so, up his entire right arm. And, so and, and, and he, he doesn't have a lot of arm, you guys. Like you, you. Well, he does, but he doesn't. I mean, his arm is toned, but he doesn't have a lot of arm. <laughs> so I mean, he, he's, he's, he, he's he's showing off that Phoenix. What well, what made you? What attracted you to the Phoenix? So to be honest with you, a number of things, literally layers, because we're we always have layers, right? So yeah. one of the bigger things is that I've always looked at, and the Phoenix for me has always been a mythological creature. Um, it didn't have nothing to do with Jean Grey, because once again, Storm has always been my favorite. But do I like Jean Grey with the Phoenix Force? Yes, I'll take it. But that has nothing to do with it, right? Um, for me, I've always just appreciated um, the lore of the dying in the fire, being reborn in the ashes. Um, I've always viewed life in that sense, right? I always see that no matter what trials, what tribulations that you go through, that you're able to go through that fire to be reborn and learn your like lessons through those trials and tribulations to make it better, um, to become better, to like really come out stronger. Um, so that's like one of the first things. The other thing is that a little fun fact about me. I am pretty much reincarnated from my uncle Calvin, um, who was my mom's eldest brother who died three years before me. <laughs> so I do accept the fact that like we was actually I'm actually a reincarnation of him. Um so that's another Phoenix era thing as well, too. Um I could probably go into that story another freaking time. I want you to go into that story because I want to know yeah. how you found out you were reincarnated. So I actually found out in like a paper and pen way as well, too. But the actual, what really happened, my, my uncle, who I'd never got a chance to meet, he passed away three years before I was born of juvenile diabetes. So like in his 20s. Um, so with that being said, my mom, three years after that, my mom said throughout her pregnancy, actually, when she was pregnant with me, she would always see my uncle Calvin's spirit. Like he would be in the kitchen with her. He would be like, like alongside her every so often up until my birth. And she had complications with her pregnancy. So it was almost like a life or death situation, very much, right? Um, so I believe she had fibroids and like complications. She supposed to have a C-section anyways. Um, so she said basically before the doctor put her out to give birth to me, she saw my uncle Calvin leaning on the wall, almost like kind of like waiting for her. She was like, you know, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be all right. Next time she woke up, of course, I was born. And I uh, I pretty much gave her, I wasn't crying or anything. I kind of gave her like this look like, yeah, we're going to have, we're going to have a life ahead of us. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, very much like, in, in a, I guess a love way, but I was very quiet and just like big eyes. And she, yeah, good, good, good times, good times. So how I found out about the actual reincarnation, because my mom, and my family just always said like, oh, you remind us so much of Calvin, the things that you're interested in. Like my mom always said like, oh, Uncle Calvin would allow you to be watching Scooby-Doo right with him. Like, or like certain things when it comes to like my demeanor, when I once again, I never met the man, right? But um, I'm very much into astrology and spirituality and all those other things, right? And I'm in this group where we were talking about astrology in particular in our birth charts. And it was something along the lines of if you're like your north and your south nodes, I'm not too much of an expert once again, but it was basically saying if it was like the inverse of someone's birth chart, rather, be the kid, there may be some pointing out to of like reincarnation. So me already having my birth chart, and I was curious. I, my, I asked my mom, like, oh, you know, when my uncle was born and all that other stuff, he got to know information, right? I'm going to find that stuff. And I gagged because literally our north and south nodes were the complete reflection of one another. And that was like a pinpoint where it was like, okay, I, I could not make that up. Once again, I never met the man. Like I only gave when based on information that I had, information that I known of myself. And that's how, yeah, it pretty much solidified. But my middle name is Calvin. So yeah, that's another 
too. But but yeah, so that's, that's where the reincarnation part comes in. That is so intriguing. Like <clears throat> I am, excuse me, I am so yeah. just intrigued by that. And I've studied things like that because my grandfather, never met mm-hmm. him before, died six years before I was born. On the on on the same day, right. never met him, never met my grandfather, um, and I look like him. I'm much lighter. I mean, yeah. it, you know, it really doesn't take much with me nowadays. I mean, everybody right. is, is <laughs> you know, unless you're white, like you know. This is a perfect example. Of what I'm doing now of, you know, a rebirth, because I've done very corporate things. Yeah. And then I've done very non, not so corporate things. I'm not going to talk about on, on here with you, right. <laughs> even though we'll talk after. Right. But, you know, I just, I've, I've had different experiences and now I'm doing something that typically, I think a lot of people would say, well, why are you doing that? Or, you know, that's not, I mean, it's you, but why now? And, and you know, I just, I don't know, the pandemic just for me created a sense of wanting to do different things and also right. wanting to be reborn. So, right. and that's exactly my experience yeah. as well too. Because, um, especially like when I started pole dancing or whatever, I mm-hmm. pretty much like bought a pole for myself. This is pre-pandemic, right? And then I was getting to the no pun intended. I was getting to the swinging things. Like at, at this point, I was starting to um to like really perform elsewhere. I was starting to work at clubs here and there, like, you know, because that was my main goal to do was for nightlife. Like, I just, once again, like, the studio aspect was cool, but I wanted to do it for nightlife. And then I was like, oh, shoot, I can't, like, really teach this stuff. So that was always the mission and the goal, right? But then the pandemic hit, and I had, my, I had a day job that I was working remotely, but then I was also doing my stuff virtually because I have a pole in my apartment and stuff. So with that being said, I gotta said, clap like, it up for that. You got a pool in your apartment. In my apartment, I, my apartment. I gotta clap yeah, it up for that. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm true to my craft. Like I'll be practicing when I practice or whatever. But with that being said, um, when it came for us to come out of the pandemic, it very much was like, okay, well, who am I once I leave my apartment? I've been in my apartment for like well over a year and some change or whatever the case may be. Am I going to be a dancer? Because I've always led with I'm a dancer. And then maybe my day job comes after the conversation, right? Um, and then it came to the point where, unfortunately, like while my day job did have purpose, like I was helping people living with HIV, get into services and things of that nature. But things was really, really, really slow because it was affected by the pandemic, respectfully. So we weren't getting a lot of clients and we weren't, I wasn't able to like outreach the way we needed to because we had a social distance and all this other stuff, right? Even as being an essential worker, we had to be careful out there. Plus I found I could do my work remotely. But um, with that being said, when I started substituting at the studio that I work at now, Body and Pole, um, it was like on the weekends, I was like freaking happy. I was good. I was enjoying myself. I was like, you know, like it was great. I felt a lot more me when it came to like Monday through Friday almost, then it was like, okay, like I'm getting emails about, hey, can people cover class on this day? Can people cover class on this day? And I'm sitting here like thinking like, damn, I'm in this office. Like, you know, like respectfully, I, was, I wasn't I was feeling the same. It wasn't feel like the office that I was in wasn't feeling like that joyous place that it did used to feel like. I won't say that I didn't enjoy my job, right? But it did come up to a point where um, respectfully I also had to think of it as like, well, why am I holding on to a space where someone else could potentially flourish in? And I know that I have other dreams and aspirations respectfully that I want to accomplish, right? And like I said, I'm a very spiritual person. A lot of signs was coming up. I was in therapy at the time as well, too. And my therapist really, the one thing that I learned in therapy, actually, was, well, you're already doing this work. It's not that you started from square one, right? Like, I'm already teaching. I'm already performing. I was doing gigs, stuff like that. It's not like I'm starting from square one. It's just like, what would my life look like if I was doing more of it? Right. And then up until the last minute, I had drafted a resignation letter and everything or whatever. Right. But I was still questioning my movement. I was still questioning, do I really want to make this jump? Do I really want to make this leap? Should I keep this job because I don't have like a proper savings? Like I'm like, you know, like, what am I going to do with this? Right. And I read tarot cards as well. So um, at least I have read for other people, but I predominantly read for self-reflection once again. Right. Um, I had brought my deck with me to work and it was right before I had my one-on-one with my supervisor. And I was just like, let me, um, let me see what's going on. 
Shout out yeah. to Black Boy Fantasy, Tarot Cards. Yes, come on, Black Boy Fantasy. I love Black Boy Fantasy art too, man. He's and so I dope. Have, I'm gonna get him. Yeah, on. he's really dope. He's so dope. Yeah, so he is. I had um, I have pulled the Moon card, which I call my Stalker card, and the Moon card very much deals with like a lot of like anxieties, bringing your fears to light, bring it like illuminating what's in the dark. If you kind of think about right, once again, we talk about shadow work, and for me personally, what I connected with, although I do go with like traditional meanings of the cards but in the same token i think the strongest interpretation is always what you interpret personally and it was basically like baby get out of the shadow stop playing with yourself you know you want to freaking leave you know you need to leave stop like stop being fearful and just go and i got on that call i had my little call i gave updates or whatever my supervisor was like hey do you happen to have any questions or anything before we go and i said yes respectfully i'll be putting them on two weeks and I have, put, and she wasn't even mad, honestly, which that's how I also knew spirit was working in a way because she was very much like, you know, like when you first got hired, you did mention your goals about dance. Wasn't sure when, but we knew that that would be something that would come up and like, you know, we support you, whatever you need to do, blah, 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 whatever. And even like my other coworkers was like, oh, like, you know, like that's good for you. We hope for the best. And like, it wasn't anything fake or phony. Like it was genuinely happy for me. And Look at me now. Um, <laughs> literally, I look at I, you exactly. Yeah, like over a year, over a year, like literally November twenty sixth of twenty twenty one is when I left my job, and it's now twenty twenty three. I'm a full time dancer. I, that's all I do is teach to pretty much and perform. Um, sometimes I might hit the club here and there. Um, okay. just because listen, I'm not gonna lie, like I'm thirty three right now. Nightlife was fun when I was felt like I was a little younger, younger, but the body, baby. I gotta be in the mood for that shit. So sometimes I do like a, if if it's a gig that I know I have the energy for, like a house of guests or something like that, then I'm like, okay, I'm there. But yeah, to do it consistently, I'm just sticking in my teaching bag because my ultimate goal is to open a dance studio. So yeah, and you will have that. Important. Let mm -hmm. me tell you something. You will have that. We're gonna speak it into existence. We're gonna manifest it because where else am I gonna go to learn how to pull this? Yeah, because you have to come to my yeah, come to my spot. Because I don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't trust anybody else. But here, here's the thing: I was going to say to you, you brought up something, and I, I wasn't even going to go there. Um, I want to know. <laughs> it's, yeah, it, it, it's it's funny. Okay. I want to know though. I want to know why pole dancing. Mm -hmm is different than stripping. <sighs> I just, I, I, I want to know. And I think they want to know too. You know, why pole dancing, excuse me, is Can different be, than so, stripping. So I could be very blunt about this. And Please, I know, be blunt. So to be completely be honest Be blunt and you, I'm going to roll up my blunt. So you be Right, okay, how about all that? Because right, so. to be completely honest with you, I know I'm probably going to piss off some people more on the mainstream industry versus the stripper. Well, industry, that's what we do here right? at my show. We piss people off. I don't care. Right. So do. with that being said, I just have this thing where I feel like the pole industry, with all due respect, while it has given me a space to be able to do what I do, to be able to feel like myself and dance and things of that nature, because the sensuality, so I just, I'll tell you this much, I was... I came up in hip hop, street jazz, and those things, right? Attempted the teaching, wasn't really hitting, in all honesty. And that came with like self doubt, that came with a lot of depression things, or whatever the case may be. That also was a contributor to why those things wasn't popping up. But as soon as I started shaking my ass on the freaking pole, things went different for whatever reason. It just, I just felt like myself, like you know, like it felt like me. I was able to like really shed that skin to really come on out and find that confidence and really do what it do. Now my classes are full and things of that nature. The point that I'm about to get at is that um, within the studio realm, unfortunately, it is very gentrified. And I'll put it this way. Um, if you think in the strip club aspect, of course, right? Um, I'm thinking more so like black strip clubs more in particular as well, too, where, you know, the girls aren't just booty shaking. But if you've seen some of those videos on like King of Diamonds or like Magic City and the girls like climbing up the pole, doing crazy tricks, all that other stuff, whatever, right? Mostly like down south clubs, I would say that I've noticed that or whatever, right? Um, that's just at, that's just the vibe, that's the, the fun of it or whatever, right? But when you get into the studio most times, um, and I can say more so in New York, I can't really say for elsewhere, but you find it's more approached almost like ballet because you have a lot of the ballet 
folks who pretty much are coming to the pole theme, right? And or like the other contemporary dancer folks are coming to the scene and they formalized it in these realms where it's like, okay, now you gotta do these lines. Now you gotta point your toes. Now you gotta do all this other stuff, right? Um, and that's why it kind of gets makes a slight bit of the difference. Now, does it help for technique? I guess if like let's say maybe there's a stripper who might not know how to climb but do want to do those damn climbs and maybe pop off and pop coochie up the pole and shit like that or whatever. Absolutely it could, right? Because I know there's sometimes where like I've had dancers who've come to my classes and like maybe I'll add a little bit of a wiggle. I'll tell them like, you know, if they want to spread something wide and this is the technique or how to open your hips, right? That makes sense. They could take that back to the club. But are they gonna do every single like pirouette and like figure head and all that other stuff or whatever the case may be also absolutely not and it could be for a hobby and where the problem where I come in is where sometimes the hobbyists will come in and be like oh I'm not a stripper try to talk down about strip clubs and talk down about that industry the sex worker industry right but you're doing this that was built off of that you're doing this with somebody who's literally in that and that's not to um, like make it like seem like victimized because there's stripper girls and boys and folks who do it for the love of it, right? It doesn't. It, it's not all the time a trauma thing, but in real reality, right? Sometimes it can be that where maybe the jobs aren't as like you know are maybe aren't as paying as much. Maybe folks have a goal or whatever that can't be met off of one type of income where they feel that they have to go to the club, right? Or they have to go into that instance to feed their families, to feed their babies, to like to raise money for school, to do like to raise money for other ventures and stuff like that or whatever, right? So you that's that's where the issue that I had at one point because I even saw this whole like hashtag not a stripper thing um online when I first started pole dancing. And I'm like, but you pretty much want to be like candy, but you talk a shit about candy. And that that's the part where I'm like, no, like, you know, like, you know, um, thank goodness, or at least for me, I always try to create a space within my classes where the two could at least intertwine, right? Once again, I'm teaching the of that, but in the same token, pole is a feeling, pole is about sensuality, pole for me is the, there's the sexual parts about it that I would not want to like take away from. So yes, if you want to pop your coochie on the floor, I want to allow that in my class. Okay, or I'm going to teach you at least like if you're attempting it, I'm going to teach you how to do it a little bit better. Right. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, oh, like th those type of things, like once again, I didn't feel like that. I try to step away from it being as gentrified as it's starting to evolve in certain instances, because I like that you put it that way, that you said yeah. gentrified. And I and I completely understand what you mean by that. I hope that my audience does. And I'll say this. I did an interview with someone else recently and they were in the, in, you know, um, you know, in, in the ballroom culture. And right. we, we talked about Paris is burning and the whole controversy behind that and how someone from the outside came in, documented, made money off of it. And the rest of them were just kind of left there, you know, to mm -hmm. continue life and, and figure things out. Here's right. the thing. We have to be very careful who we let in to our spaces, who we, you know, do things with. You know, I mean, it's so easy for someone who does not share our experience to come in, do something, and then criticize. Right. It's so easy because they have no idea what we go through day to day. You know, and and you know. I just think that anyway, we just have to be more protective. I, I was going to yeah. go into a whole different thing, excuse me, but I think that we just need to be more protective of our culture, yeah. the things that make us us. And right. while it's okay for people to come and they want to learn, leave the judgment and the criticism alone. Leave that at home. And, and, and we don't need that. You know, because we deal with enough of that as it is, you know, just as us as black people, us as young people, we deal with that enough. And right. even within our certain, you know, our, our communities, we deal with a lot of that. And, and it's just we don't need people from outside coming in and wanting to do things and learn things, taking it and then going back home. Because for a lot of people, this is life. Yeah.
There are people like, you know, you're doing it and, and, and you're making a living off of it, but there are people who have no other choice. And this is right. what they have to do. We have to remember, not everyone has the same experiences. Not everyone has the same skill sets right. to where they can go and work at Walmart or where they can go to school and get a you know certificate in, in something and, and go on from there. We just have to right. remember. And, and I'm glad that you brought this up. I'm glad that you said this because this is going to segue into my next thing. Um, mm -hmm. And and pretty much what I've noticed is there are a lot of parallels between the stripper culture and the music, the hip hop music, the you know the music that you know we we all listen to, and like right. there are just so many parallels between um, stripper culture and and you know music. There are also parallels between hip hop and like queer culture, and I wanted to ask you about those. Do you do? You, Talk about those with, with, with us, you know, um, those parallels, any if, if you can think of. Yeah. I mean, well, when, it, when we do think about hip hop culture and when you say like strip club culture or strip culture in general, whatever, right? It's so funny because ironically enough, um, I see hip hop not only just the musical aspect, we talk about film, we talk about television, we talk about all of those other things, right? Um, it could be rituals, it could be all of those things, right? perfect example the players club the players club is an iconic freaking movie um even though yes there are parts of it that is very traumatic and in, in nature as well too but that was also one of the movies that yes my young self was probably had grown up with that i would like that was also part of the entry right like diamond was my girl actually my life almost was like the flip side of diamond in the sense that diamond was like working at the strip club to pay off her college degree to become a journalist i literally went to to college for journalism public relations and then ended up when i mean i did want to be a dancer but ended up doing like strip club nightclub dancing like it was kind of almost the invert of that right um but also as well too if you think about like the video vixens in the in the um in the music videos as well too right you got video vixens dancing even nowadays you see a lot more of music videos where it's like featuring strippers like i can think of like megan the stallion movie um video right um when she had I think it's her little jerk that thing that's all together. Like, when you see, like, a lot of these examples of, like, you know, like, folks starting to pole dance more in their stuff. Like, P-Valley is a huge part of our culture now, where now they're starting to get, like, seasons renewed. <laughs> like, threes and fours, you know? Like, so it, it is very much ingrained, right, Um, in some capacity. Um, I, once again, like I said, I do, in a sense, love the part of how in certain aspects in mainstream, it is becoming part of like a good culture because for me, once again, it's a human aspect of it, right? Strippers, yes, in that regard, are we showing chest, are we showing ass, are we showing like skin or whatever? Absolutely, right? But we're still, there's still a human being in that body. And why are we degrading strippers? Why are we degrading these folks or whatever? And like, you know, just for showing what we're born in. <laughs> in that regard, I'll tell you right? why. I'll tell you exactly why. And see, yeah. we, we, we totally go places like this where I'm about to go on this show. Mm -hmm. People are very jealous. Yeah. They're very jealous, not, not just because of what someone outwardly looks like or, or outwardly does. Right. They're very jealous of the confidence that a person has to go out there, get up on stage, and take their clothes off. Right. That takes a lot of confidence. Same, yeah. same with same with this. This takes a lot of confidence. Same with someone who you know um, deals with the public all day, every day. Same with someone who may be you know overweight. Yeah, it takes a lot of confidence to go out and face the world. And those people who have so much to say about it. They're the ones who lack the confidence, and that's why they're so hateful, and that's why they are so jealous and have so much criticism. Again, right. so much to say about what a man or a woman is doing with their body or doing to make money. Right. And I say, live and let live. Because it's autonomy. Everything ain't <laughs> yeah. for everybody. 
everything ain't for everybody. Which and is totally true. Who, yeah, it's literally not for everybody. And I want everyone to understand that as well, too. But like you have right. said, it takes not only a lot of courage, but also just because in the society that we do know that we do live in, okay, where um, it's a misogyny thing as well, too. If you think about, like, with patriarchy, we want to, like, suppress feminine bodies of feminine expression especially when it comes to women right doing it women in particular like owning their bodies owning their sexuality say hey this is what i want to do right and that's going against that you know like it's, it's a lot of things that like on a hierarchy part where it's just like living like you said live and let live you know what i'm trying to say like and why who am i to tell you i mean you know yes there are certain things where you start to have a moral compass but absolutely the same token if it's but a who, who is thing, anyone else to tell someone else what their moral compass is or is yeah and when it's consensual you know, you know right. like that's the next part of it as well too you know like if, it, if it, you're not being coerced into it if this mm. is something that you and the other parties are consenting to this should at least be like they say don't completely uh, like legalize sex work in a sense because it's still going to be like those juxtapositions of like okay what can get you in deep trouble versus what you get you like okay right there's still stipulations they do say decriminalize because it can soften some of those blows right like you it won't like involve that much police um in certain <laughs> instances right. as well like you know it can also open up the possibility for resources for like sexual health and things of that nature like it can like have a little bit more doors open versus like being in completely illegal versus being completely legal so you know um, you just brought something up and and i'm gonna go into that but i want to say something really quick really quickly um you know it it sort of reminds me of what has been going on with medical marijuana mm -hmm. and i and i'm gonna have somebody on who's gonna talk about that soon too but what I find is, you know, a lot of people think that medical marijuana is just weed. It's just smoking. It's just herb and flower. And, and, it, and it's more than that. Mm -hmm. You know, there are tinctures, there are creams, there are oils, there are all kinds of things yeah. under that umbrella of mer med miracle. <laughs> under that umbrella miracle. of miracle. It is. <laughs> see, look at that. Under right. that umbrella of medical marijuana. So, and things that the people who have a lot to say about it would benefit from. Because I can tell you a story. I, you know, I had an older family member who had a lot to say about medical marijuana, but mm -hmm. happened to get a cream with THC in it to help their arthritis. And, and they loved it. And I'm like, right. but this is what you're fight. This is what you're complaining about that you don't like. Right. Again, people just have so much just so much to say i want to i, I want to go here though um i want to shift gears really quickly mm -hmm. you just brought up something when we, when you were just having that that discussion about funding um sexual health health uh uh you know sexual health funding um tell me about the activism that you were doing right. your outreach and everything i want to know about that right so i do it even um, until now, I do a number of things, right? So okay. a lot of my advocacy has been centered around, well, granted, the queer community. I've done things with the sex work community, but in the HIV advocacy as well, too. So I was a part of the HIV Stops With Me campaign um, for three years. I haven't done it in the past couple of years, of course, because I wanted to focus on dance. So a lot of things right. I was shifting because dance was my number one focus. Um, but basically, I've been HIV positive for the past 13 years. <laughs> um, I'm undetectable, which for those who don't know what undetectable means, of course, that means I've been virally suppressed to a point where I cannot pass the, the virus to anyone. I've been taking my medication, maintaining my shit for the past 13 years. Okay. Um, I tell people not too much is different but the weather, very much. Um, but no, so I've done a number of campaigns. HIV steps for me You're a campaign mess. on the president. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is what it is, right? I hear you. Um, I hear you. But no, yeah, I've done the HIV Stop for Me campaign. I'm part of the um, Impulse okay. Group NYC. I'm the president of the chapter, actually. So basically, we're a nonprofit organization funded by a chapter, a healthcare foundation. Um, where our mission is to engage, support, and connect our queer community globally. We say gay men globally, but I always like to be 
all encompassing Inclusive. in that regard right. because it's more than just gay men out there. Um, even if like made mass presenting, but it's more than just gay men, right? We yes. we got to get with the times. Um, mm-hmm. so with that being said, also we talk more about like sexual health, mental health, and substance use, but I always like to throw in that little bit of part of like social justice, diversity, inclusion, making sure that um not only are we talking about even in any type of dichotomy, right? Where we have our queer community, um, there's still that level of maybe either racism or classism within our communities, right? So we can know that although we might be clumped together as gay, there's still certain hierarchies with like gay white society versus black and brown society. I can talk about our HIV rates specifically, how although within our community, the rates have been decreasing, yes, with HIV, but it's been decreasing more with white counterparts versus our Black and Latino counterparts, we're still disparagingly getting infected with HIV. And we have to ask why that's so, right? And there's, you know, access to information, the, or lack thereof, you know, like who's getting the access to these resources, okay? Um, lack of lack of knowledge in the sense that like folks are getting more so information just from hearsay versus going to the doctors, going to the clinics, or like finding out what type of funding we have, you know, like um, or if, if you are HIV positive, it's just still stigma surrounding it, right? Um, so with that being said, it's like how do we break that? And with impulse in particular, we throw our own events where we have most. Most times we do like fun stuff. Like, you know, we have sit down dinners. We even did like a um a coffee table book the very first year that I did it. I've been doing it for four years. Um, but that's like to bring visibility to these to these topics. And we do it in disruptive ways too, right? So um in essence, when we talk about um like even sex and sexual health, we had discussions surrounding kinks. How do you safely like talk to your partners about the kinks that you're into? How do you safely navigate those kinks? And like, you know, like if you're talking about common negotiation, right? Like not use a condom versus use the condoms, those type of things. We have those real conversations about what we really do versus just dressing up, telling what you should do. but talking about, well, this is what you're doing. This is how you can also help the cause out to stop, like, you know, stop spreading um HIV or other STIs because there's other STIs okay or talking about like if you are going to do certain substances we have a big drug chart where it's like okay well this substance has like no contraindications versus this substance is deadly if you mix these two you know so it's a matter of saying like well if you are going to do G no you're not going to do alcohol with it because you can literally pass out or like potentially die yeah. You know, versus if you're going to do shrooms and marijuana, that's probably one of the safest mixtures that you could do, you know, like surprisingly enough, like, you know, so those are the type of um informational pieces that we provide to the community. And uh, for me, I guess, just ever since I became HIV positive, I didn't plan on being an advocate, but right. in the same token, I've always been combative, including when I was younger, like I always used to be a little bit of a debater and wanted to like pop shit. So it just kind of went hand in well, hand. Well, you're from Brooklyn, you know, you can't help it. That's what y'all yeah, do. Exactly. And, and that's what we Brooklynites do. Exactly. Pop shit, so, exactly. You know? so, but you know, I, I, I love that. I love that the services, what they do is they're all encompassing because if you're going to give people, you know, the information on safer sex, give them the information on prep even, give them the information on the drugs. You have to be a one-stop shop and you have to be full service. Give them the information on, you know, what not to mix. Give them information on, you know, housing benefits and and how to get, you know, an Obama phone, you know, how to get, you know, healthcare. I think that that is something that we're very lucky to have. I hope that it continues to be funded. I hope that um, they throw more funding money at it because right. it's something that it's, it's, it's a need. But I want you to do something for me. I want you to put to rest because there are a lot of people, queer people, cisgendered people, heterosexual people. There are a lot of people who have a lot of misinformation regarding undetectable what right. that actually means. So right. I want you to go into, I want you to talk about that. Yeah. So um, I'll be completely, completely, completely honest. And I always like believe okay. in throwing myself under the bus because at the end of the day, I'm grown. 
who going to check me, right? <laughs> so with that, well, nobody's going to check you here. Like, you know, we, this is a But no, I always like to just preface nobody's that. Nobody's going to check like, you here. Just, like, because mm-hmm. I, I, I love my mom to death. But if she ever hears, once again, I'll grow, right? It is what it is. But it is, I always say, like, I share my experience for the sake of education. So with that being said, we're talking about undetectable dispelling myths. Once again, I have mentioned before that if you are undetectable, a.k.a. you have HIV, you take your medication. I think um, you can, if, let's say if you're newly positive and you take your medication at least within the first three months, it used to be six, you can end up maintaining your viral load to a very, very, very low number. Your viral load means the amount of virus in your bloodstream, right? To the point where you cannot transmit it to other people. That does mean, yes, that if within, that's why I say condom negotiation, right? So for me personally, um, does that mean that I can have sex without condoms? Yes. Is it always suggested? Not always, because once again, we have to drive back home. While I might not be able to pass HIV to someone, people can pass other STIs to one another in general, right? So you have syphilis, you have gonorrhea, you have chlamydia, chlamydia, all of these other things, right? Bam. So with that being said, um, when it comes to kind of negotiation, there's always that talk that should happen rather where, hey, I'm always disclosing my status. So you can't tell them, say that I've never told you my status or whatever, right? But B, it also does come down to, okay, when was the last time you were tested for other STIs in addition to HIV? And if you are clear and good not clean, let's not say clean, because that is stigma, right? There's nothing dirty about a person at all, even with other STIs, okay? Especially when the other STIs are curable, they're treatable, you go, you take your shot. Like, those are things, once again, that should be normalized in the sense of, if you want to be the, uh, I'll just be blunt, right? If you want to be the biggest hoe, be the biggest hoe, but just go get tested, that's told that's the difference you know like don't just do what you do say oh i'm negative like be like blinded by the fact like you know blinded so to speak and be like oh well things look fine things look fine or whatever just go get tested and know that you don't have chlamydia or gonorrhea or any of those other things you pass it and keep busting it open or busting someone open do it okay do it but if you're also like i always say this like when a negotiation comes in if you're not having those clear signals or those clear conversations respectfully bring in a condom you know, because and or, I, want you, and also, I want you to say it again. I want you to say it again. Yeah. Get tested. Get tested. And get yes, tested. wear condoms, like, you know, like, especially, yes. um, that's not to say like you have to wear condoms, but yes, you should wear condoms if you're right. going to engage, right? Especially if you're not sure of somebody's status. And even, way. even when you're in a relationship, I think you should. Yeah. Not just because me personally, I just think it's more hygienic. That was a little right. joke <laughs> That's from hard. Noah's Ark. You remember? You remember that? Joke? Yeah. You remember Noah's yeah, Ark? From Noah's Ark. Okay, good, good. I, I, I just want to make sure I'm not like aging myself, but. Oh, no, yeah. Definitely get tested. Everybody, yeah. listen, listen, get tested. Just do it. And don't just get tested for HIV, get a full panel of tests. Full panel. Stop get a full panel. Okay, yes. all of your parts, yes. every single part, everywhere, take, everywhere, everywhere. Okay? Now, this is what I want you to do for me, and yeah. and do for the do for the class, do for the audience. Please explain prep, right? Because a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions about mm-hmm. prep. What prep is, what prep does. Right. Please explain that for the class. So, let's. Say, I'm gonna bring conversation actually to two medications. Prep and PEP. Okay, but okay. I'll go over PrEP first. So okay. PrEP, which is the pre exposure prophylaxis. Okay, I should surprise. I remember that on this shit. Um, pre exposure prophylaxis. Long story short, that is it's not a vaccine, right? But it is a medication that helps block the inhibitors. So, in that way, let's say if you are exposed to HIV, once again, you have to maintain this. So, you're taking the pill every day, right? Um, there are such other regimens. But I'm more so about the one that you take at least once a day, okay? Um, you take that for three months, of course, or more. Similar to how, like, I'm suppressing my virus, it's just creating a barrier for infection. So if someone who's HIV positive, like, maybe you have a slipper, maybe you use condoms, but the condom broke, and you don't know that person's status. 
it'll at least block the HIV from coming onto your cells to create more of those and it'll kill it in essence, right? Because if it can't latch to something, then it can't last. Um, now, that's your continued regimen. And the let's once again, dispel a myth, right? Because once again, there's still the stigma around PrEP where people feel like, oh, this person could be promiscuous, this person is XYZ or whatever, like, or they're doing XYZ, right? But if you think about it, you have to get tested every three months and be clear of all STIs as well as HIV in order to take PrEP. And also, so, let me just yeah. add this. When you're on PrEP, it's very, very important that you go to, to your, your um, primary care doctor and yeah. you get those physicals because you want to make sure that your liver, your kidney levels, you want to make sure right. that all your levels are good. So right. don't just be taking PrEP and you're not going to the doctor because yeah, to. something very, very bad could happen to you. Right. Yeah. And um, especially because I know Truvada, um, which was like the first prep regimen, it was affecting liver and kidneys to a certain degree. So I know Discovy is one of the regimens now where they're going for it. And if I'm not mistaken, they're even looking if they haven't done so yet, they also look into injectable regimens as well, too. Um, that's including with HIV treatment as well. So you have options. Right. Um. So now PEP. PEP is the one that I'm talk um that I wanted to mention as well. Let's say you're not on PrEP and you have an instance. There could be a, let's be real about life once again, right? You're having sex and either PEP is a uh, post exposure uh, Yeah, post exposure right? prophylaxis, okay. right? right? So that's post exposure, right? right? So basically let's say if you're having um not like condomless sex, multiple people don't know their status, like you didn't have a conversation, maybe it was like sexual assault anything can happen right you within 72 hours or less you the the closer the better right you go to the clinic for pep where you take a regimen for 28 days um in order to prevent once again that hiv infection from happening and you have to come in that window period in 72 hours or less it can't be more than that right because at that point like you know it'll probably be a little bit harder to really to prevent but you take it to 28 days and once again, you come back for your testing. Um, so there's options once again, and including condoms where you can mix those things, right? If you're on, let's, and let's just put it all together. Let's put the equation together, right? You have someone who's HIV undetectable, who's not able to transmit, plus a person who's on PrEP, that's like very, like virtually not happening. And then imagine if that person that's on PrEP is using condoms as well too, you're literally not transmitting anything. You know what I'm trying to say? It's including STIs. So your your safe sex is safe. Now now there's nothing that's like a hundred a thousand percent safe, but like those like are the are the probability of you like not having any type of transmission is very, very, very low. Versus someone Y'all got that their status. Right. Y'all got that? Uh, we, right. That everybody understood I hope y'all got what that. What Deshaun right. said. Right. I hope everybody got that. And and one one thing I want to add to is is in you and I have talked about this. People need to stop using HIV medications such as like Devado that aren't formulated for prep as prep right. or pep right. as pep. And I'm not the guy on the beach in the commercial. We're just in the beard gang. That's all. Right. Uh, somebody exactly. was like, aren't you the guy? <laughs> no. But we have to educate our people yeah. and educate the people who are ignorant because there are a lot of people who are very ignorant as to what is what. And, and it's just our job to do this. And that's why I had you on because I think that it was just, it, it, this is, was a conversation that needed to be had, you know? And I want to ask you, and I don't want to be, you know, intrusive or anything, but right. how did you find out 13 years ago? Right. So 13 years ago, what happened was I was in a relationship. Um, okay. It was a short lived relationship, respectfully, but I was in a relationship with someone and it was monogamous. And long story short, what happened was after we broke up, they had gotten tested. Respectfully, they did call me as soon as they got tested and found out the results that they were positive. Um, and what they told me what happened was that they had a partner who didn't disclose their status to them someone that they was dealing with before me, right? 
So that also goes to show as well, too, because a lot of folks have the stigma of like, oh, like, you know, people sleep around and blah, 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 whatever. No, I was in a very monogamous relationship at that time. Um, And granted, I was I ended up getting into another relationship after then, which things did get affected. Right. Um, Both my partner and I at the time, we was like very scared. We was young. So that kind of dissolved and I was just going through my thing or whatever the case. But um, so. Ironically enough, what happened was it was like a the window period thing, right? Where I had gotten tested at one point, it was like negative. But then the next time I ended up getting tested, it was positive. And that like kind of like I had like real delayed reaction. I was like, oh shit, like what's gonna go on? Like what's getting like what is life gonna look like? You know, like I'm thinking like to me at that time, this is like still early two thousands or whatever, where um where I was just like, what is life gonna look like? Where am I gonna get a dance studio? Am I gonna be able to dance? Like, what's my life been gonna be like? You know, like but I was blessed to have the resources once again, because I went to the Hedrick Martin Institute. That's why I was tested. But it was the HEAT program that did testing for adolescents and stuff. It was um, funded through SUNY Downstate, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that's in, like, Brooklyn. And I was going there for treatment, for case management. They helped me, like, you know, like, disclose to my mom, because I didn't tell my mom for, like, six months. But once my mom found out, like, not found out, but once I... I told her, um, once again, my mom was very, very supportive. Like, we got through our crying, all that other stuff, but she was very supportive. And um, I was able to just be able to be linked with medication, be able to, once again, get my testing, be able to get linked with proper, like, insurance and so I could pay for my medication, those types of things. So medication is expensive as hell if you do not have insurance whatsoever. I remember one time I had a gap in my insurance, and... Like a bottle is three thousand dollars or was three thousand dollars. And but in New York, there's a program called ADAP, um, which they help you like if you don't have insurance or if you're in between, that they like it's a state funded thing where they can help pay for your medication. So once again, and I'm gonna leave all of that that information up on in the post for for everybody. I'm gonna leave that information up for for people who, you know, are interested and and may need um, some some help. I want I want you to do to to share some advice for mm. someone who may have some doubts about their status. Perhaps they think they've been exposed, but they're afraid to get tested, or they know they've been exposed, but they're afraid to deal with it. Right. So I'll say this: everything is confidential. So go get tested. Go to the clinic that you can go to. It is confidential. They're not going to tell your business. Like, it's not like, you're like, you know, literally everything is confidential with that, number one, right? Um, when it comes to if you are getting tested and if you end up becoming positive, I always do tell people, let your emotions occur. Do have that moment, but know that that is temporary and know that you can maintain it, right? Once you get out of the clear, once you get out of like, and I, I say for me personally, if anything by HIV has the effect has been mental health versus anything else, right? Because you have to get through that mental block of like, oh, this is what it's going to do to me, blah, blah, blah. You know, to be like, okay, well, I got to take my regimen. I got to take my pill or I got to take my, like, you know, my shot. I think once a month now they could do it for once a month type thing. So like, you know, there's resources that are there, but you're doing a disservice to yourself if you're prolonging or if you're like letting fear take over right um the best way to get over that is to know versus being uncertain um because knowing like if especially when you do become positive and you're on the road to get become undetectable that's a lot more safer to know your status positive or negative versus being in the in-between and that's how we could stop the spread that's how we could stop the stigma as well too because if we could say over and over again, undetectable is untransmittable. So as long as we know that we can like at least stop it at some point, but it has to be widespread and it has to be a collective thing, right? So um, if you are just having doubts, at least like maybe, I feel like everyone should also just have that one freak friend <laughs> that they could be like, and it's just that friend, right? Not to say that they're having sex with one another, but that one friend that they could talk about, be like, girl, I'm busting over eight people. I got freaking gonorrhea. And then that person, like, be like, well, you know, like, did you get tested? Did you get, like, you know, did you get that shot, blah, blah, blah. Someone who can affirm you to do better 
And when I say do better, once again, it's not shaming you and saying like, oh shit, you shouldn't be busted over eight people. But if you're going to bust it over those eight people, make sure you're getting your shot or make sure you're getting your azithromycin or whatever that you need in order to target it, right? Or let's say when you have that standpoint of like the HIV or whatever, you need that person to kind of lean on to be able to have those like doubts one day is to be like, hey, well, listen, like, you know, you still live in day by day, right? Take that medication, do what you need to do. Like, you know, your, your life still matters here. You still human being. You're... I always tell people as well, too, aside from the, the pill pushing or whatever, there's other parts to me, right? Like, I'm not just going to tell you, like, just take your medication, live your life out there. You know, like, and you do that as, for me, I feel like HIV was that second chance for me in a sense. Because I took like you take life for granted. I've, I've, and I've come across, with all due respect, a lot of folks who were HIV negative and heterosexual persuasion as well, too. Let's not talk about the gay folks. The straight folks need some education, too, right? Um, where they're taking the stuff for granted. They're not taking their PrEP medications the way they're supposed to. They're not, like, you know, like, they're thinking that, oh, like, HIV is a gay thing, right? Or something like that or whatever, right? So we have to be able to break through all of that in order to be better. You know, like we have to be able to be like, listen, like it's not just a gay thing. You need to be taking your medication. Or we need like people who are more supportive of one another to be like, well, this is what you're going through. I'm here for you. Talk it out. What What do you and, need? And like, you know, that? knowing, right. I, and, and not to sound cliche and cheesy, but right. knowing is half the battle. It is. Yeah. Knowing is half the battle. So if you know, yeah. Yeah, you can alleviate a lot of the stress of not knowing and being in the dark and just being, you know, in just a state of, of, of mystery and a state of right. you know, confusion. But I want to lighten things up a little bit. Yeah. Explain to us all what a mocha witch is. Because I went on your page and I saw something about a mocha witch. And, and no, oh. I'm not talking about the game that your grandmother keeps asking you to put on her phone. That's bubble witch. <laughs> not that so let what me um witch? so i'm a huge geek i already okay. mentioned earlier that like i love storm with yes. that being said i love like marvel and i'm more of a marvel fan i do have my dc favorites but i'm more of a marvel fan right so i'm thinking like for those who don't know which you should know like captain america black panther all of the other stuff right but i'm more of an x-men fan all that stuff but that being said where did mocha witch come from the scarlet witch so the Scarlet Witch oh, from okay. the comic books, right? Um, because yeah. I'm into like magic and stuff like that or whatever the case. I said okay. Mocha Witch because I'm black. So, <laughs> so very much that. Um, but also because I'm a ma black magic, black magical being, like that's how um my whole shtick as well, too. When I when I kind of describe my my dance persona and in terms of who Dave Phoenix is, um, I say that like once again, I, I go through a lot of it, like, for me, it's, like, sex magic. Like, I feel like that's, like, my conjuring, my sorcery. Like, when I'm always moving, so to speak, my thing is, like, to cast a spell. So, like, you know, like, if, I would say, if you're seeing this visually, how I'm, like, kind of moving the hands and things of that nature, like, it's very much like a an allure type thing. That's what I always try to teach in my class as well, too. It's not just the movement and the technique, but it's also about the allure, the attraction, the, like, that like that glam if you ever used to watch true blood like the glamour right like how you like draw somebody in like in lust and attraction type so, thing. so speaking of spells and and dancing yeah a video is going to be up right here where where yeah. my pen is now right. that video is not going to be up on uh on on youtube right this is why you have to subscribe to the patreon so you can see the video period and see what's going on and see what he means because right. i am not this is a new show Right, <laughs> not getting banned because I put up the clappers. Right. <laughs> so if you want to see the clappers, <laughs> subscribe to the Patreon because that the video is going to be right right there over my shoulder. Um, right. So you had a show though, right? Um, I did recently. So tell me, tell us, tell us about the show and what was the theme, yes. the theme of the show? So the show is called Black Phoenix Nest. Um, to give a little bit of background, what Black Phoenix Nest is. Hey, I used to call my apartment the Phoenix Nest. That's like my home, my space or whatever, my sanctuary, right? Um, Black Phoenix Nest, basically, the whole spiel of that, A, is to 
give a platform for black and brown queer individuals who are of the sex worker persuasion, who are strippers, or even stripper allies as well too, because not everyone who did my show was a stripper, but they do erotic dance and things of that nature, right? Um, with that being said, I would say it's for raw, uninhibited movement, just to really celebrate sensuality, to celebrate sexuality, to bring it back to the stripper roots, or in essence, my papa strip club. That's very much exactly what it is. Um, for me, I've I very much come into a very corny space in the sense that they always say that if you don't see something being represented, represent it yourself. And for me personally, I haven't seen that space where I know that, like, yes, have I danced in clubs that given me the chance to dance in my little skirt or like my little G Josh strap or whatever, maybe in heels? Absolutely. I'm not going to say that not every single establishment don't accommodate me, right? That would be kind of ignorant to say when I've done certain gigs, right? But in a larger scale of things, when you do look at certain parties or you look at certain events or whatever, especially on a stripper standpoint, there are certain people who do look at, look, look in a certain persuasion, More, mainly muscle gays. I'm going to be upfront. Or when it comes to like the actual stripper shit that I like to do, you see a lot more of like maybe more cisgender women with like gentlemen's clubs. They don't have the, I mean, with the exception of the Q and Hush, which are two clubs in like, you know, Hell's Kitchen, where they just try to install like the poles and stuff. You don't have a lot of gay or queer spots that do pole. Maybe like, um, actually the monster does in um, House of Yes, where I do gigs every so often, right? So, but then there's the part about Black folks and queer folks getting that space, right? Um, so with that being said, I was like, baby, it started off as a birthday thing. Um, in 2020, um, I did my very first Black Phoenix Nest in, at the Tank um, on 36th Street. And it was like, it, I say it's like my Polesque cabaret, right? So basically, I have like, once again, this, things like that, doing pole, doing off pole, all of this other shit. Um, the pandemic happened. So that was like my first show. And that was in 2020, I just turned... Um, did I turn 28 and 29? No, I turned 30. That was my dirty 30. I just turned 30. That was in 2020. Are we getting old already? Are we getting forgetful? Yeah, baby, because I'm, I'm 33 years old and I'm like, oh, baby, whew, I forgot. I forgot. So no, um, I'm glad that I was able to bring it back because when I first did it, it was more of a stage thing, but this time okay. it was more immersive. And I wanted that once again, a strip club feel, like people shake it ass to your face. So I went dollars, like just money flowing, like mm -hmm. hip hop, trap shit. Like it, it was really, really freaking dope. Um, yeah. So once again, I kind of go with like the magical ties type thing or whatever. So this time it was, the theme was sex magic. Um, and I was able to have my red lights. Everybody was like doing some nice little vibey, like mostly R&B, but like also some trap stuff. I did my mm -hmm. Megan Thee Stallion set because, you know, my fellow Aquarius. Happy birthday, Megan Thee Stallion out there. Shout Today's her Meg. birthday. Shout Megan, out to Pete, Meg. I hope you're doing good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Um, oh, my God. I hope she's good. I really hope she's well. Yo, that's my Aquarius sister. I don't know her personally, but I hope she's good. <laughs> but, um, I hope she so watches. Yeah. I hope she watches. I hope she watches too. Yeah, I hope she watches. Yeah. But no, the, a part of the show as well too. Um, what I had ended up doing at least this time around. Um, not only was it just my birthday show and to make some money or whatever, right? But I also did it as a philanthropic cause. So I raised money. Um, I did a portion of my ticket proceeds. I donated to an organization called Trans Asilius or Trans Asilius. And basically, it's ran by Amon LaCare, who um, she founded it in order to help transgender and non-binary asylum seekers seek safe havens in other countries. So I was able to raise a thousand dollars for her, for her cause. Um, <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I still got some of my strip of money upstairs, so oh, it's been good. It's been great. Um, so now, you have a show yeah. coming up too, right? Do you have a show? Plenty of, oh, I got plenty of shit. All right, so plug your shows. Come on. Yeah, so so tell us about the shows you have. So next Friday, um, I'm doing Stick a Pole in it. Stick a Pole in it, for those who don't know, is a comedy and pole show. Um, I won't be doing it at the same time. There's five pole dancers, five comedians. Hey, if you can, then that's that's amazing. I wish, too. but I mean, I'm not gonna be <laughs> on the pole talking about so you know, like a, a Jew and a nun walked in a bar, like. That's not me. No, that ain't happening. Oh, uh, but no. So, but I, I do the pole dancing. So it's the Prince show, the Prince show. Uh, and then also, I'm going to be in Los Angeles March 24th, 26th for the Black Men's Pole Weekend Extravaganza. So we're, I'm going to be teaching workshops as well as performing for the very first Black Men's Pole Showcase um, and fashion show. So I'll be doing their fashion show as well too. Uh, in June, June 15th to the 18th, 
I will be curating as well as performing for the Men of Pole Showcase for the International Pole Convention. That'll be in the DMV, um, as well as teaching shout my workshop. DMV. Yep, shout out to the DMV. Um, I'll also be teaching my pump and grind workshop there as well, too. So that's, um, it's not in pole. Yeah, pump and grind. Yes, pump and grind. It. Yes. I love it. So I'm going to be teaching people how to um do some floor work with their heels, how to shake their ass on the floor. Like, because people think, oh, it's just a pole. No, friends, you got to be on that floor, too, friends. You got to be shaking it, popping it, and dropping it on the floor, too. And you got to make sure you got some strong ankles. Yes, yeah, strong ankles. Because it's positive. all in the ankles. I'm Absolutely. curious though. I'm curious though. How many calories can someone burn during one of your pole classes? Like, I'm just curious. Plenty. Um, to be honest with you, plenty, plenty. I don't know the count, but I know I'll be sweating bullets when you do. So I mean, you because do it is a full body workout. Yes, and you do. You use every part well of your too. body, just about every muscle. I mean, when, yeah. you, when you're doing it. Absolutely. So, um, cause the way that the class is structured, like you also do a warm up before that. So you are doing some stretching and some like squatting and all the other stuff or whatever, working out core, working out upper body, things of that nature before you even hit in the pole. Cause you want to prevent bodily injury, right? So there's that portion. Then you actually go to the pole dancing where now it's like, okay, muscle engagement, especially if you're lifting up. <laughs> okay. Like a lot of folks, like they just want to lift here, but you also got to squeeze them shoulder blades first, yes. like to lift your body. That's very like important. Like the last stuff. And right? I mean, listen, there's nothing worse than than being on stage and you get a Charlie horse. I think no. that's probably the worst thing that could happen. <laughs> I've had, yeah, and I've had no, yeah, I was gonna say because no, as a matter of fact, I haven't had too too many issues being on stage where it's like, oh shoot, like something happened because I make sure that I warm up, right? Um, have I had injury before? Yeah, because I had a wrist injury before for like a good few months, like not last year, but the year prior. But thank goodness through physical therapy, I'm good, and I'm even busting out more Shout out to the physical tricks therapist. that I wasn't, yeah, sure, I'm um, busting out more tricks therapist. that I wasn't even doing before, so. Look yeah. at that. Look at that. This is something this is something I ask all my guests. Um, you know, when we kind of, you know, start to wind down, you yeah. know, in the show. If you had a time machine and you could use this time machine to go back in time, what would right. this Deshaun that I have on my screen right now today mm -hmm. go back and tell the young little big-headed Deshaun from Bed-Stuy, yeah. Madison Street, Flatbush, Crown Heights. What, what would you go back and tell him? If so you can I pull up this Facebook post that I made for my birthday, actually? Please, um, please pull it up. Ironically enough, you asked that, and that was my Facebook post. Um, so I would have pulled it up for J-Way 28. See, I'd be knowing. I'd be knowing. Yeah, it, yeah, it must have been the freaking vibe, absolutely, because yeah. that's legit what I had answered. So let me pull that up real quick, and okay. I'll read it on out. Yeah, um, pull I wrote up a that Facebook post. So yeah, like legit, it's, it's, it's there for anyone. I see. <laughs> so, see, that's um, a hell of a post. Go oh, ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna, I'm gonna mute. I'm, I'm gonna mute myself, and I'm gonna let you go ahead. Yeah. So, hey, little Deshaun, this is your 33 year old self. I wanted to let you know you're doing fab. You're going to have quite a few experiences in your life you'll have to bounce back from between losing loved ones, fires, and even disease. But just know throughout it all, none of it has stopped you and none of it ever will. Your mom will still love you throughout your highs and definitely through your lows. Your friends will help bring you laughter when you feel like everything will crumble, although you may not outwardly express those moments. You've become a part of community in the most unconventional way, and they love you not only for your talent, but for the spirit and zest you bring into any room you step in. I wanted to make sure to come back to you to let you know everything is all right. You're, abs you're about to have the best year possible. You'll be performing for multiple stages, teaching numerous folks how to tap into their sensuality, and curating events like your birthday show that you'll have in some hours, because that I did my birthday show on my birthday. Um, you're steadily becoming the butch queen you were born to be. I'm here to tell you I'll be shining my brightest on your behalf. Much love and happy 33rd fucking birthday, Squirrel Day. Squirrel was my nickname, my grandmother and my uncle. Oh, again, happy belated. And that was beautiful. I mean, thank you. You're gonna put that company that that what is that company? Future Me. You're gonna put Future Me out of business with that. <laughs> I mean, that, that, and, and you know, it 
it's so funny because we have so many things in common. I did the same thing. I do the same thing on my birthday every year. Mm -hmm. um, I write a letter to myself and then I open it up and I read it next year. And one year I did it with future me. And then like, you know, and they emailed it to me like that same day, like a year, it, you know, in advance. And what I do now is I just write myself something. I just put it in my notes app and, you know, go back and read it. I don't open it for the whole year. And of course, right. you know, other notes accumulate throughout the year. But, um, you know, it's just something that I've always done. And I think that's important for people. That's very much a big part of, what we talked about earlier in doing yeah. your shadow work, you know, is writing letters to yourself, writing notes to yourself, writing affirmations to yourself. Like, I'll show you something. I have this, um, and this is very old, and, it, and I've had it for many, many years. You can't even see it, but it just says, yeah. you're going to make it. And yeah. it's, it's just something that I sit, you know, on my desk, along with other stuff I have on my desk. Like, I have a timer on my desk. So this, I call oh, this yeah. my customer service timer. So, so listen, I turn this upside down right. when I have to call customer service and I say, okay, if they can't solve my problem by mm. the time the sand <laughs> is at the end, they're a shitty fucking company. Period. <laughs> it's it's a five minute timer. If you can't solve a problem in five minutes over the phone right. and doing something you've been trained to do, then you not only oh, yeah. do you have some issues, but right. you're working for a shitty fucking company. They need to train right. you better. Anyway, how can people get in touch with you? I'm not, I was about to go down a different road and we were about to be angry man. <laughs> this is not the angry man show. Listen, uh, if you live in New York City, there pl there's plenty of that on the radio. Yeah, right. That part. There's plenty of yeah. Sorry, Flex. I had to borrow your bomb. I had to borrow it. We was thinking, oh my God, you said it and I thought it. That's crazy. <laughs> I love Flex though. Fle Flex, let me tell you something about Flex. Flex is like WWE right. on the radio, but it's like WWE involving, you know, rappers and, and, and you know, just hip hop culture. Mm -hmm. But that's not, we're not doing that here. And once again, Flex, I'm sorry I had to blow your bomb. It is what it is. How can people get in touch with you? I mean, wait a minute. Do you want them to get in touch with you? Because after that, okay. that I had up there, I, you might catch some stalkers. Oh, you can listen. You can get in touch with me as long as you're paying. Okay, how about that? You heard him. <laughs> let's let's, let's heard talk him. about that. So, you heard what he said. so, with that being said, because like I said, make that money. Don't let it make you. Um. No. Okay. So, with that being said, um, my main platform is on Instagram. So that's okay. Day Phoenix. D E Y P H O number three, and then the Nancy I X. Um, you probably might have to type the whole thing in because I'm most likely shadow banned. Um, <laughs> so would that be, yeah, that means I'm doing my job properly. So, so yeah, D E Y P H O number three N I X. Okay. Um, I do have a Twitter, but my Twitter does just usually just be popping shit. But if y'all want to follow me just because I'll be popping shit, my Twitter is a uh, Phoenix Joe star. Um, and that. Yeah, that's P H O number three N I X Joe Star J O E S T A R. You are such an anime head. It's not even funny. I just and I'm so glad how you caught the references. Well I totally too. did. And and listen, anime people, you make sure you, you yeah. Um, so it's not a freak Twitter. It's a pop off Twitter. No, so it's a pop off Twitter. Man. Yeah, 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 I ain't gonna mention that about no freak Twitter because um, no yeah, then I really have stuff. Yeah, because again, but, like, like <laughs> you said, you got the pay. So Wait, say that again, one more time. <laughs> you got to pay. Yeah, you got to pay. Y'all got to pay. Hey, so once pay. again, that's D is in dance, E is in exist, Y is in yellow, P is in paint, H is in house, O is in orange, number three, N is in navy, I is in indigo, X is in X on IG. Wow. And no hot I, I want to thank you. Well, listen, I do this all day. <laughs> I want to thank you. Thanks again to Sean for stopping by. I'm going to have you on again. The people are going to love this. And, and listen, I want to thank everybody out here for listening and watching. Tell your friends, tell your mama, tell your daddy, tell your baby daddy, tell your boyfriend, tell your sister, tell your cat, tell your dog, tell your everybody. doctor. Hell, tell Jeremy. Uh, <laughs> you know, to Sean's first kiss. To watch me and, and to follow me um, right. on 
Twitter and Instagram at Chris David TV and follow our show at the Chris David Show on Instagram and YouTube. That's Chris with the C, no H. David like Dave, like David Robinson. TV on IG and Twitter and the Chris with the C, no H. David like David Robinson. Show on YouTube and IG. You can also visit my website, chrisdavidshow.com, where there you'll find links to all the great things I mentioned, as well as our Patreon for exclusive content, like the video of the clappers that's going to go up there. All right? <laughs> so that's Chris with the C, no H, David like number 50, David Robinson show.com. And the cash app is Chris NYC. So that's that C is in cash, R is in register, I is in interest, S is in savings, N is in new money, Y is in yen. <laughs> C is in, what about my ching, ching, ching? And that's it. Everybody be well. Thank you to Sean. Y'all take Thank care. Thank you, absolutely. All right, so I'm gonna throw this up. And I'm just gonna have you, so wait a minute, before I have you do drops, how'd you get Sean over here? You didn't know Sean was out. <laughs> so, but, but, you know what? And I'm gonna tell you something. This is something I've noticed on yeah. social media. Just, Thank you.